Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to sit down with Portage La Prairie Mayor Sherilyn Knox. But before we dive into our interview, a brief moment to acknowledge the support that keeps our show thriving. We want to acknowledge John from New Brunswick and also Sarah from Nova Scotia. Thank you for helping us to continue to grow the show and bring more exciting content to you. If you want to join a growing list of supporters, visit crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support today for as little as $3 a month. Now, on to the show. Mayor Knox, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to get to the very first question, and I think it's the most important question I ask municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Sherilyn? I think it came from, I'm a very solution-oriented person, and I'm not one to be somebody who points out problems without helping trying to fix it. And I think that those are, that's where it led into conversations with people who were maybe previous municipal leaders who who I just was interested in what was happening in our city and they encouraged me to get involved in municipal politics. Simple as that. that, Simple is always the best. But before we get into your time in office as a councillor and as mayor, I want to get to know who Sherilyn is. So was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or was it something that wasn't really talked about? Like most families, you don't talk about politics and religion around the dinner table or was it actually discussed? Yeah, it it sure was. Um, I come from small town, Manitoba, like a population of a thousand. And so um, sort of town politics, like municipal politics wasn't really discussed at that point. Um, my father was a veterinarian. He um, he was a had a government vet clinic. That was the way it was back in the day, and so he we talked about it in that sense. My parents were conservatives who um, talked often about conservative government. So it wasn't something we shied away from, but it also wasn't something that I would like that was drilled down our throat or anything. Yeah. Did you ever expect to be a politician growing up? Was that something that was ever on your radar to be? Or was politics sort of a, a desire of yours? No, never, never. <laughs> and and you'll never see me be a party politician, ever. Um, I often get asked that. I'm very, um, I really like the grassroots of municipal politics. And so this is this is this is as far as you'll see me go in the political world, I'm afraid. So what was happening in 2018 that uh, Sherilyn finally said to herself, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the last ele- only election that I can see that you ran as a councillor. You may have ran beforehand, but for some reason, elections results prior to 2018 are very hard to come by in Manitoba. I don't know why, but there they are. Um, in 2018, you decide to put your name forward, I believe. What was okay. the decision based on? Um, this exactly what I was saying before is that I had lots of conversations with um, friends in the community and and I really I love our city. I have only lived here for 12 years in Portage of Prairie. And so I've lived a number of places. And I when I first moved to Portage, I moved because my husband was from here and I commuted back and forth to Winnipeg to a major center. So for the longest time, I didn't feel part of the community because I wasn't in it. And then I began working in the community and really fell in love with this city. I fell in love with the people I I worked in nonprofit. So I fell in love with the people who are trying to make our city better. And so I started talking with friends about some of the bigger issues and things that we had challenges that we needed to face and how our city is growing. And so my friend encouraged me to run and I hummed and hawed because this isn't a full time position. And so I knew when I did it, I would have to do both jobs. Right. And so whether I could do that and I said no for a while 
And then he teased me and called me Betty Crocker, big talker. So I like to tease that I got a little bit bullied, which is a totally teasing on it. And I decided to run and I just have enjoyed it ever since. So let's go back to that 2018 election for someone who sort of lived in the community, knew what the issues were in the community. You you learn new things about your community when you actually go out and speak to the and I say average resident, but I, I mean the residents, right? Because you, you go door knock, you go to community events, and you talk to people that you may not have actually talked to prior to living in your community. When you, you were discussing topics in that 2018 election, I know it's only five years ago, but uh, mm-hmm. I want to see if you, you can remember, were there issues that were coming up from your neighbors, from the residents of Portage La Prairie that you were shocked at, that you went, oh, I didn't think that this was an issue for our city, but I'm glad someone's bringing it to my attention. So if I'm elected and sit, have the privilege of sitting on council, I'm going to be able to address it. I, I don't think so. And I don't think a lot of the major issues have really changed that much in the last five years. Um, you probably, if you're across the country, we all know public safety and crime is is something that's really at the heart of municipalities nowadays, and we only have so much that we can do on it. So that was a big topic of conversation. What I really found, and the reason that I carried on and, and decided to become mayor is because I found that the perception of our community is different than the actual reality in some sense is that we've had issues where you know we've been unfortunate enough to be on the mclean's top 10 of crime in the country um and that's based on crime stats you know they they are can be in your favor and against you a lot of times and so I really wanted to, and our goal as our council now is to change the story of our community. I really found too, is that if I talk to people who have lived here forever or for a long time, is that I found more negativity than I did with new people in our community who saw the, who saw the hopefulness or saw things improving as they go. And so I want to figure out a way that we can have everybody telling the same story about the great things happening here. Well, the reason why I reached out to you is because I had the privilege of stopping in Portage La Prairie earlier this, literally in August, uh, at the beginning of August. And I can tell you without a doubt, uh, without a lie, that it was probably the most friendliest community that I was Mm -hmm. in while I was there. When I went to Tim Hortons, people were just saying, oh, hi, you're from Alberta, because they saw my license plate. And we just had this conversation that I didn't expect to have because you're just a tourist and you come to your community and people like to keep to themselves. But there was sort of a pride in your their community when they were talking to me, even when I was walking downtown by City Hall. People were stopping me. There was a gentleman who stopped me right at, in front of City Hall while I was taking a photo. And he asked me about where, where I'm coming from, where I'm going. And I told him all about the tour that I was on. So there is a perception, but I find that the perception is a very friendly community that people would want to come and see. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think we just have to tell that story louder. We just have recently been working with uh, doing a strategic planning with an outside organization or outside company and they've spent time in our community and sort of infiltrated themselves a little bit and and they really found that right is that yes people recognize that we have issues uh, which every community does but that there's just so much positivity in this community and beautiful things and amazing people and opportunity that we just need to tell that story louder than the than the other part of it Getting back to who you are and your sort of journey through municipal politics, you decided four years after being elected in your first term to take a stab at the mayor's chair. Now, it was a contested election, Um, leveling up in that way, going from councillor to uh, uh, mayor is quite a task because it's 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 a full time job, but not a full time paying job because you are on 24 seven. When you made that decision, was it hard to finally say to yourself, okay, I'm taking the leap here and I believe that my vision for the city would be best served if I was sitting in that mayor's chair? 
Yeah, I think so. And we we had a mayor previously who was here for a couple of terms and he was a great mayor, I, I thought, and I really enjoyed working with him and he decided it was time to retire. I guess we can allow people to do that or move on to other things. And so with encouragement from him and other council members, um, I just wanted to see the momentum of things that we were doing continue. And so I felt that I was the person to maybe do it at this time. And, and I'm glad I did. Do you think you were better prepared being a counselor prior to being mayor? And I'm not not slighting anyone who just gets elected into that mayor's chair without the counselor's uh, ba- uh, uh, previous experience. But for you, do you think the uh, the ability to go into that mayor's chair sort of gave you sort of an understanding of what the mayor's role and responsibilities were pr- if you had didn't have that experience? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And especially in a community, a city where we're a city, so there's a lot going on. I, I think that that experience is important. And for a couple of reasons, not just because of the fact that I'm representing, I'm elected by citizens, and I'm working with a team of counselors, but we have a city staff and a city administration who work very hard. And all I thought about was when I started was if I was a brand new person that didn't have any experience around the council table or any experience at a board level or a committee level that they would be spending their time teaching us to be in those roles rather than keep carrying on with what the great things are happening in our city. So I've thought a lot about that actually. And I encourage people to, to have that experience because I think it it's important. What was the biggest eye-opening experience for you going from the role of counselor into the role of mayor? Because counselor, you're one vote, mayor, you're still one vote, but you have a lot of other responsibilities outside of just that one vote for you. What was the biggest learning curve to becoming mayor? Um, I think it was because I was a, an, they would say I was an engaged counselor. So I was involved in lots of things and, and I felt I was engaged and, you know, took part in many things. What I've learned is that the mayor is involved in everything. So, so that's the biggest difference is everything that's happening. I get informed on or involved in and, that it's more of a time thing, right? And then also being the spokesperson for the city and and taking on that role of making sure that we're communicating to our public. And I just think it's it's important. So so that piece of it. The but again, I'm one person of a team of a council. And so I really believe in democracy. And I believe that as a council, we all have our one vote. And I think we've done a good job of that too. You you have had to deal with a lot of issues, I'm assuming, over the last five years, four years as councillor, coming up to one year as a mayor of the city of Portage La Prairie. And every time you walk into that council chambers, you have to be informed on a range of issues, but not be cemented in your ideas of what you are going to vote on or how you're going to vote on issues, because you have to be open to hearing from other councillors, but also from the general public. How important is it for you as mayor to be prepared, but not be ingrained in how you're going to vote. Yeah, I'm, I'm a believer in getting all the information possible. And I believe I'm never, well, I try to think (laughs) I'm never the smartest person in the room. And so I really take from other people's experiences and other people's thoughts and feelings and knowledge on things. And I think that that just makes us better in these roles when when we don't have preconceived notions of what we want. Like that's what I say about our council that we have right now is I can say wholeheartedly that everybody came for the right reasons. It wasn't because they were mad at this one thing because if you go on to a municipal council mad at one thing, it's going to be a long four years for you cuz you're going to learn pretty quickly that there's a lot more than your one issue and you're probably going to lose at the table to that. So it's a little bit disheartening. Yeah. 
So how much do, how much does, does respect play in the role as mayor? Because you have to respect everyone's opinions, even yeah. those who disagree with you from the general public as well, who come to you at public hearings. While it has to be respectful, you have to respect them enough to be able to voice their opinions. How much does respect come into play when you're sitting around that council table and ensuring that people are willing to engage in a respectful debate on the issues and sometimes your side or their side might not win. That's right. Um, I think respect is of utmost importance. And I think as mayor and I'm the chair of that meeting that I have to make sure that that's what's happening in that room. And I believe that every other council member needs to be respected. The people in the gallery are staff and administration. So I have to lead that conversation. Um, I think that people sometimes just, it's emotions that happen with people, right? And you just have to remember that. And I think as long as you're communicating effectively, then then it's going to be a respectful environment for sure. You, you mentioned a word that I love, and that is communications, communications, yeah. communications. That is key for a lot of municipalities, particularly in 2023. But we are seeing that communication can only go as far as people want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, you can put it on social media. You can put it on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, Instagram, Facebook, website, in the newspaper, on the local radio station. But there's always going to be people who say, I didn't see it. I didn't hear yeah. it. <laughs> you were shaking your head for those who are listening to this. You know this because I know this as a former communications person who worked in a municipality. How yeah. do you deal with that? How do you engage with people in a respectful manner while understanding that unless you go knock on every single person's door, you're not going to be able to communicate with every single one because some people just won't understand it until you put it right in their face. And even then they may say, I didn't get it. That's right. And so I, I have a method that I deal with this is, first of all, I ask a person, where do they get their information? Right? So I say, where, where is it you get your information? Are, are you getting it from our online media? Are you getting it from social media? Is this? And then I lay it out for them where they can find it. Right? But I, but I like to do a little bit of put it in your court as to Okay, now I understand you, where you're getting your information, and maybe that tells us that we need to do more. And But here you go. Here's where you can find it now for future. Is and there so an app? Do you find that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics, when particularly about the issues that are facing your community and people wanting to engage and actually give you solutions that might possibly help their community? Or are people engaged? Um. Yes, in, in both sense. Um, there, so there's an apathy, but people are wanting to engage. I love it. Please explain, though. Well, I I think I have a love-hate for social media, Oof. right? A complete love-hate for it. I think it's, I think it is an accessible form of communication. Um, I don't think it's positive communication a lot of the times, but if that means I'm still going to use it, right? Um, but I make it clear to anybody who tries to reach out to me, I will, you will never see me debate on Facebook. You will just, cause it's a, it's a losing game for that, but I will use Facebook to put out facts and information of things happening. Right. And also in these positions too, the less, the less I read it or listen to it, it's better for my mental health as the mayor for sure. Right. Um, but I just think that people, there are people though who have great ideas and great um, ways that they want to get involved that you have to find ways for them to listen to. So I have a technique of, like I say, when somebody tags me or calls me out on Facebook, right? I offer them, here is my number, here is my email, let's have a meeting. And so then I take it from, is this really something that you want to talk about and be a part of the solution or are you just griping? And so probably 20% reach out, but I still give them that option. Yeah. I want, I want to talk about the personal and private life of a local elected leader because you don't get to go off to Winnipeg or Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community 24-7. So you go to the grocery store, you're the mayor. 
Yes. If you go to the council table, you're the mayor. And I can imagine in a community your size, in a city your size, people know who you are. And I would say that because I went to Tim Hortons and it was the very first community that I did this test and I got a response that I was actually shocked at. I asked the local barista who the mayor was because I asked this in numerous other communities and no one could tell me until I got yeah. to Portage the Prairie. And the barista, a young gentleman, probably not even 15, 16, who was working the counter, said your name. And I was shocked about this because a 15 year old or 16 year old or however old this gentleman was said your name and I was taken back. So how do you balance the life of a mayor in a community your size where people know who you are and probably want to stop you in the grocery aisle at the park dealing even at the drive through at Tim Hortons and talk to you about what's going on in your municipality? Yeah. Um, Chris, I have to say, I appreciate you telling me that, especially when you're telling me it's a young person, because I, that's that's important to me, very important to me. And and I have, you know, I spend time in the high school and I spend time in these places because I often tell people when, for instance, you drove down our Saskatchewan Avenue and the project that we're doing, that's going to be beautiful. And, and I get people saying, well, I'm never going to use that bike lane. And there may be in our upper age in our community, I say, well, you know what? Sometimes we're not building these things for you. We're building these things for the future generation. And so that, that I appreciate you telling me that. Um, as for I, the values, uh, honestly, and yeah. I, I'm not blowing smoke here, uh, your worship, Mayor, uh, Mayor Knox, but I have a newfound respect for your community because when I was there, the amount of people who were engaging with me, who I was just some random person, it was amazing. So I give credence to you, your council, your administration staff, and even your residents for being so friendly. So anyway, continue your story. I, I can't speak more enough about your community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now I have to remember what we were talking about. We were talking, we were talking about the balancing of the personal oh, and private yeah. life. And I can imagine there's days that you just want to be Sherilyn. I can imagine there's days that you just want to go grab a uh, carton of milk, come home and just be Sherilyn. But yeah. you are Mayor Knox when you go out, no matter what. So how yeah. do you balance that, that aspect of a, uh, of a, a municipal politician? Yeah, I've, I've, I really <laughs> realized I've, I've, set myself into this position for for now and and that's okay and I mean I love talking to people and so I don't mind when people are coming and stopping me in the grocery store and and just today I was going from my one office to this office and I think it took me an extra like it's Portage of Prairie and it took me an extra 25 minutes because of people that I was talking to and so um I, I do. I'm really good at balance, though. I'm lucky enough to have a family life where I have a place where I can get away to sometimes and and do that. But this is this is why I signed up to be here for the people. And I'm assuming the people appreciate it because I looked at the 2022 election results and you were far above the top <laughs> vote getter in that election, even in the 2018 council election. But I want to turn to the city as a whole now. And before I start this uh, this topic, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is her opinion, because that's what the council table is for. This is just a conversation between two people. So Mayor Knox, and I use that because this is an official question. What do you believe is the biggest issue facing the city of Portage La Prairie today as of recording this episode? Um, I would say public safety is is our biggest issue and the perception of public safety and um, the issue of the systems in our province and in our country not all working together. And so we yeah, uh, yeah, so so we we take the brunt of that, right? And also we we here in Portage of Prairie are have, Indigenous neighbors, and we we have our First Nations around us, and so we have a lot of high population of Indigenous communities, and and I would 
not be truthful if I didn't tell you that we have issues of systemic racism that we need to we need to work on and and as leaders is we need to be helping change that. So the million dollar question to that answer is how do we do that? How does the city of Porters the Prairie, yourself as mayor, your council members around that table, start addressing the issues of public safety, systemic racism in a uh, municipal level? Because uh, one of those is a federal and provincial matter. One of those is a social matter, and that is all levels of government needing to come together to fix the systemic racism issue. So you you talk to me about public safety And I'm saying to myself, that's not a municipal issue. That's a federal issue that is becoming more prominently a municipal issue. So how are you as mayor and council trying to address this issue locally right now until the feds and the province do something? Yep. Uh, First of all, we're working with the province. We're lucky enough to be one of the communities chosen to do a community safety and well-being plan, which is a huge step in the right direction. Um, We've just received some funding that sort of was a surprise to us and we're very grateful for it, but it will help us um, add some layered policing. So community safety officers, hopefully we're just in the initial stages of that, improving our bylaw. Those, Those are the type of things like, you know, that's enforcement, that's that's public safety in that sense. Um, The other pieces of it is I will continue to to shout out loud about the issues with our systems and how they're not working together and use my voice as much as we can to try and make some of those changes. As for the systemic racism is, I just, I believe by taking some of these issues out of the shadows and bringing them into the forefront is is the only way we're going to move forward. And so I'm we're working on building relationships. I'm working on, you know, I'm meeting regularly with uh, the leaders of our Hearst Nations around us. And and we have an urban indigenous peoples coalition here. Um, We just we just need to to work together because our issues are the same and we want the same outcome, but we have to figure out how we can do it together. But I, and I think showcasing that or, or not shying away from it is the only way we're going to move forward. I want to jump back onto the public safety because you, yeah. you talked earlier on about the perception of your community with McLean's being uh, naming you one of the top 10 cities in Canada for crime. Um, now, I've had the pleasure to sit down with two other mayors from that that list, and they say that the worst thing that the 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 worst thing that happened is that list coming out and naming, but it's true. Statistics don't lie. Give me some glimmer of hope that there's some there's some shining light at the end of the tunnel here that your community is turning around and hopefully not going to be on that list two years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because the work that you're doing today is going to set up the future of Portage the Prairie around public safety. What are you doing? And do you see glimmers of hope that it's changing in your community? I I absolutely see, I don't know if I have major glimmers right now because they're, they're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, you know, addictions issues and, and poverty issues, all of those things. And, but so now we're working on a few things like layered policing, which means if you really think about it is we might have more police support. So that means there might be more people arrested and there, that might mean the shoplifters are being arrested. So what does that do? That increases your stats. Yeah. So your stats may go way up because you're doing more when it comes to public safety. But if people just look at that numbers as blanket, it's not telling the full story of why that's happening. Right. Um, but I but I do think that we have a lot of great organizations in our community that we have like community mobilization. We have, um, you know, some improved mental health services. And the more that we continue to work on those, then the more we're going to see improvements. But 
that all it's going to take all levels of government working together for that. The reason I ask that question to municipal councillors is when I come to your community, which I did, I yeah. asked local residents what their top issues are. Sort of, sort of that sort of uh, hidden shopper, or secret shopper that they do. You go in, you just talk to people, like I did with the barista at Tim Hortons, and public safety was probably one of the issues that was talked about, but it wasn't the most important issue that most people were talking about to me. Again, this is just a very yeah. small selection of people who I was talking to, the gentleman downtown, a few people at Tim Hortons and around Crescent Lake where I stopped uh, just to take a little walk just because I wanted to stretch my legs. One of the issues that was talked about is things to do in your community and mm. sort of the engagement because yes, they had the, uh, I think it's the splash park and I forget the name of it right now, but there's a giant uh, water slide and it looks amazing. Um, but just things to do, like you have to go to Winnipeg to go do stuff. Um, how do you balance the needs of your community with what council sees at the council table? Because you're dealing with public safety, you're dealing with social uh, issues but people are wanting more infrastructure funding for a skate park or uh, indoor pool or this, that, or the other. I, I you kind of shocked and you, I saw your eyes glit there, but how do you balance what your community wants with the direction that you see your city needing to move in? Well, I can tell you that we're breaking ground on our brand new multi-use skate park in a week. Um, so it's, over <laughs> it's like I talk plus. to people. <laughs> That's right. It's a $500,000 project right and it is going to be winter summer all of it which is exciting um as for things to do i i often get that from people but when i ask them what those things are they don't necessarily have answers for me or they might say they might give me something that we already have here Right? Like so, a skate park that's about to break ground? A skate park that's about to break ground or somebody talks about, you know, the movies. Well, we have a theater here. Like it's, it's, I think part of it is too, is helping people understand their own community and enjoying their own community. And so we're working on new tourism initiatives that, that do that, right? Because we have some of the best facilities in, we have, we, where we partner with our region here a lot, like the RM and the city are very much partners. And in the RM, we have our Fort Lorraine Museum, which is considered one of the best museums in the country. And I wonder how many citizens or residents of Portage of Prairie have visited it. Like, yeah. You probably get inundated with requests for upgrades of uh, sidewalks, upgrades of streets. And I was driving around and I saw that there are major improvements going on in your community. But when it comes to budgets, municipalities can't run deficits. End okay. of sentence, period. Yeah. When you're around that council table and you're looking at the list of requests from administration and the list of requests that people have brought to you and said, I want my pothole fixed in front of my house. I believe we need sidewalks on my street because it's safety for my children. How do you look at the issues and try to figure out which ones you're going to do, but not make people feel like their issues aren't important to council? Yep, that, that's a big one. And one of the things is where we've had some really great councils who've been fiscally responsible in the last while. And so I'm really happy to say that our city is in a great financial position. We understand what reserves are for future planning. Um, we also understand very much what asset management is and asset management planning, and then also capital project mm. planning. So we have a 10 year capital plan, which, which is such a useful tool when you're with citizens, right? Because they may say, oh, this, I want that sidewalk fixed, right? And when are you gonna do it? Well, we have that tool and that planning that I can go and say, you know, I agree with you, that street needs to be fixed or that sidewalk needs to be fixed. And it's scheduled for 2027 right now. Right. So people realize that we hear them and we see the issues, but 
it's just not in the budget right now. And, and are people, people willing like to that. accept that? Yes, yes, yes. Most people, I believe most people, because they know that it's it's thought out, right? Like right now, we're in the middle of our Saskatchewan Avenue rejuvenation, and it is it's a project that previous councils for forty years talked about and never did. 2018, our strap plan, we were lucky enough to have a council that said, this is it, this, we have to do this. This is, this is going to be important to the growth of our community and what, who we are as a community. And so when we did that strap plan, we, we didn't know how we were going to pay for it that day, right? It was, but we're going to do it. And we're lucky enough to have great administration and great fiscal responsibility and partners in funding that we're doing it. And it's a $44 million project that we saw no tax increase for because of how, how we planned. Wow. Yes. No direct tax increase. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You talk about the financial realities and the financial situation that municipalities are in. Um, the job of a municipal councillor is quite hard and municipal mayor is quite hard because the decisions you make on a day-to-day basis around that uh, council table directly impact your residents. The day after you make them, bylaw changes, the budget gets passed, it impacts your residents. You as mayor have to then go out and sell any decision that council makes, whether it comes to financial issues or even a tax increase, one, two, three percent, zero percent tax increase. How do you do that? Because I can imagine that weighs on someone because the decisions you make around that table are going to affect your neighbors, your family members, and people who are struggling in this economic uncertain time. Yep. I think we really have to be prudent in the decisions that we're making, but also we have to believe in them too, right? Yeah. So if I if I believe in something like, for instance, Saskatchewan Avenue, which we get a lot of brunt from, is I will take it and I will listen to every citizen complaint and every business person's concerns because I believe that much in that project, right? Um, and as I didn't think as, it was that bad of like construction area. Like it's just, it's a normal <laughs> construction zone to me, but it's again, I, I'm not living. Project. It's a oh, yeah, okay. it's, 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 yeah. Um, but I think what I've done with my communication style as mayor, which I've chosen to do is to give all the information I can at every time, because Number one, I say the more I can communicate to people, the less they can make up. So that's key. Yeah. And and also so that I want people to be always looking and listening for that information so that they know that they can trust that when we are making this decision and maybe there's a 1.94% tax increase on their mill rate, that I'm explaining to them why we've made that decision. And so we're not getting that. And if you can tell them what you're doing with the money too, right? Like, like for instance, four years ago, or a couple of years ago, because of the RCMP retroactive costs with the new collective agreement, we had, we did a one-time tax increase of 4% to be able to put that money away. Okay. One time and communicated that to our citizens. Do you know how many complaints I heard? Zero, because they understood it, because they understood that it was out of our hands, we had to pay for it, but this is what we are paying for. And public safety is important to people. So, so. You, that, you, that bill for Portage of the Prairie was close to $1 million, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 975,000, yeah, yeah. We're still, we're still lobbying to, try and not pay it so yeah um i i i could continue talking about the city of portage the prairie for some time but i want to turn to my favorite subject and it's a subject that i uh, posted on instagram the day that we recorded this and that's tourism i love tourism i love visiting communities i love going into our own backyards we often talk about tourism being mexico or the united states but i think there's a lot of tourism spots here in canada that people need to see um 
And I got a glimpse of the city of Portage La Prairie while I was there, including mm-hmm. the world's largest Coke can, which is it such an amazing bad. thing. Um, but for you, as the mayor, as a former councillor, now mayor, what are some of the hidden gems of your community that people may not see if they're just driving on Saskatchewan Avenue through Portage La Prairie? What are some of the off the beaten tracks that you should see if you're coming to Portage La Prairie? For, for pure beauty of our province and enjoyment, Delta Beach, which is 10 minutes north of Portage in our region, because we we have a regional tourism, um, which is, it's like you're looking into the ocean when you're on the beach there, because it's such a vast lake. Um, lots of fishing out there, ice fishing in the winter, hidden gems. Um, Island Park, which has our beautiful duck pond, it has our, what we consider some of the most best pickleball courts in the country. They're right nestled in our park, which are amazing. Um, and I don't know if you know that we have the um, National Indigenous Residential School Museum here, which is, was I just- I did not. Yeah, we do. So it was, it's right in uh, Long Plain First Nation in the, in the urban reserve there. And um, it is a national museum and just sort of in the last few years getting going and and growing and has seen visitors from all over North America this year. But we know as it, the, the knowledge of it, that it continues to be something that people will want to visit and understand and, and get to know, so. Well, I'm making a special trip now for that because mm-hmm. I'm I'm a massive fan of anything museum like. So, uh, mm-hmm. just to see that part of our Canadian history would be a, a unique experience and probably an eye opening experience, uh, let alone. But what about yourself? After a stressful day at council, after a long day at work, where do you go in the community to decompress? And before you answer, you can't say your own house because yeah. every mayor and counselor wants to say that. So for you, yeah. where in the community, and you can say your house if you want, but where in the community do you go to just let it all go, refocus yourself, and then be able to get back at it the next day? Yep, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a golfer. So <sighs> Portage Golf Club has, we have a beautiful 18-hole course and we're lucky enough in our region, we have two golf courses because we have Southport, which is a nine hole golf course, just six minutes outside of the community. So you kind of have the best of both worlds because I would say Portage golf course is a little bit, a little more challenging course. And some people get intimidated by that. And Southport is a beautiful course that you can, great for families and kids that just want to learn. And there's a driving range out there. So Lots is, of is Southport on the other side of Crescent Lake? Yeah, Southport is just so it was the old Air Force base. That oh, is okay. Mm-hmm. So two that's two in our region. Yeah, and so you you got lots to visit because we just announced too that the air shows here next summer. So the snowbirds were just here. So you got lots to come back for. Oh, next summer it's a date. You nine yeah. eighteen holes on the golf course. Um. I want to end on this question. I think it's the most important question I ask a lot of mayors and counselors. And that is, in your opinion, what makes the city of Portage La Prairie such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? I think that we we're, we're in a great geographic location because we have everything you need here, everything you need. You have all your shopping, you have all of your doctors, nurses, we're building a brand new hospital, exciting, all of that. But yet, if you want, the Winnipeg Jets are 45 minutes away and they're your hockey team. So you can go do that. You can have a really great quality of life in Portage La Prairie for a fraction of the cost of some of these other great major centers. And I think that that's unique about us, for sure. 
Sherilyn, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's always a pleasure to sit down and talk about municipalities, but also talk about why people get involved. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for serving your community. And I will be looking forward to getting back to Portage of the Prairie next summer for the air show and 18 holes of golf with you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking. <laughs>